Tell you what, that's a good, that's a good verse to memorize. It goes right along with uh, uh, our series that we've been preaching on, on the mind. We're in a series on Wednesday nights, What's on Your Mind? And one of the things, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit tonight, about meditating. You need to meditate upon the Word of God and the things of God. It's so important. You know, your mind is the greatest computer that has ever been created. Down to the fact that uh, you can almost smell smells that you have smelled years ago without them being present. You can remember things uh, from years ago. Now, you can't remember what you ate for breakfast, but you can remember things from years ago. And it's just amazing the mind, how it works. And, and uh, you, uh, you can close your eyes and see things that happened in your life. You can close your eyes. It's almost like a reel going backwards uh, on some things. I, can, uh, I mentioned before about uh, uh, I could close my eyes and I can see reenacting basically that time that I seen that train hit that car uh, there in Piedmont. And that's been years and years ago. And you can just see it. And there's just things that the mind can do that nothing else can do. But the thing about that also, if you put the wrong stuff in your mind, it's there also. And Satan knows what buttons to push to bring up that junk many times. And so we've got to meditate on the right things. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me tonight to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. What's on your mind is our series. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to tonight. Matthew 22. Look down with me at verse 34, and we'll begin reading there through verse 40. It says, But when the Pharisees had heard that they had put the Sadducees to silence, or that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And you probably know what verse we're going to, verse 37. And Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, Loving the Lord with All Your Mind. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can meditate upon just as the song that was sung, Lord, a scriptural song, a scripture, Lord, uh, teaching us to meditate upon it. And Lord, I pray that you just help each of us tonight, Lord, to get something that will strengthen us to walk with you. Forgive me of my sins where I fail you. Help me, Lord, to be uh, diligent to preach that which the Holy Spirit leads and guides. And Lord, I pray that you would be exalted. And Lord, give us something tonight that will enrich our lives in our walk in you. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. This reference goes back basically to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 in the Old Testament, where in verse 5, is, uh, uh, or in verse 5, Deuteronomy 6, 5, rather, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And basically, as Jesus is, is, is uh, saying it here, and then you find it in, in other recorded in Mark and also in Luke, Mark chapter 12, and verse 30, and Luke chapter 10, verse 22. But it deals with the mind of, of, of a person and the soul of a person and the heart of a person as loving the Lord with all of those. And it's dealing with that in these verses. This command is considered by the Lord Jesus as one of the greatest, not one of the greatest, the greatest of all commands. Look there in verse 38, it says, this is, the, this is the first and great commandment. Isn't it amazing that uh, it seems, well, man, you mean you're narrowing things down to this, that this is the greatest of, of all commandments, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and, and, and mind? That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said there. When a Christian gets this settled in their hearts and lives and lives, most of everything else is going to fall into place. When you love the Lord that way, with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you're going to desire to do what God wants you to do. You're going to do the best that you can. That doesn't mean you're not going to fail. That doesn't mean that you're not going to slip up. That doesn't mean that you're not going to sin. But what it does mean that there's going to be those times that 
When those times come, you're going to correct those things in your life. You're going to turn to the Lord for forgiveness. You're going to walk with God. But it's putting you in a place in your life when you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind to live for God to the greatest ability that you possibly have. And that's what's needed today. But when the love from the heart, the soul, and the mind is not directed toward the Lord in its entirety and it's divided, then you'll find no rest. You'll find no or very little peace or joy as you should in the Lord. You know why we got so many Christians today that they're, 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 they're like a yo-yo. They're up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down in their spiritual lives. It's because of their love for the Lord. It's because of their love with their heart, soul, and mind. Therefore, they're back and forth and up and down so much, and it's hard for them to live that Christian life. And many of them are not enjoying that, that rest, not enjoying that peace, and that joy that the Lord wants to give. Living a defeated Christian life many times. Living a life that is, is miserable, to be honest with you. I'll tell you what, some of the most miserable people in the world are Christians who are out of the will of God. I mean, they're, they're meaner than a yard dog sometimes. Uh, they're just like an old coiled up rattlesnake ready to strike and they're just all upset all the time. Without this complete love for the Lord, the Word of God, the commands of the Lord are become heavy. They become grievous to you in your daily walk. You know why people want to argue about do this or don't do that or I don't have to do this anymore and, that's all, and they look at the Bible and they don't want to take the whole word of counsel of God? It's because of their love. There's a problem with their love. And it's because of their mind is not in love with the Lord and their heart's not in love with the Lord and their soul's not in love with the Lord like it should be. In Matthew 22 and verse 40 says, These two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He said, everything hinges right here. He said, if you're looking for a pivot point in your Christian life, if you're looking for something in your life that pivots one way or the other, he said, look at this area right here in your life. Your love with your heart, your soul, and your mind for the Lord. He said that is the pivot point right there. Everything hangs right there. Everything. So, well, preacher, I don't quite understand it. Okay, it's like this. To be honest with you, in a marriage between husband and wife, everything in that marriage is going to pivot on that love one for another. It's going to pivot on that. You can have... A so-so marriage, you can have a rotten marriage, or you can have a great marriage. It all depends on that love, one for another. In the same way it is with our love for the Lord. And so we find Christians in different stages of their lives, uh, depending on that love. So let's consider what it is to love the Lord with, with all your mind. Verse 37 there again, so Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with... Now, I want you to listen to this, and I'm going to repeat this verse several times, but it says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You've got to put those two all together. First, we've got to make a statement that it's impossible to, come, to separate those in a person. You cannot separate out the heart, the soul in the mind, in a person, as though they don't touch one another. Every one of those overlaps the other in a person. They overlap in, in so many different ways. The heart is the affections and the seat of the will. Okay, That's where your affections come from, the heart. That is the seat of your will. Your desires come through there. The soul is the living power to use one's life and purpose Otherwise, there's something that drives me to do something. That's my soul. But with that also, you have the mind, which is the intellect, to which we process or receive God's Word and truth, whether we receive it or not. But it's the, that's what part of the processing is. God made us that way to receive that. But in each one of those, they overlap the other and they affect each other. And so therefore, if the mind is not where it should be, neither will the soul and the heart be where it should be, the affections. Only when these come together in obedience and affection and desire for Him can we love the Lord as we should. So to love the Lord as this verse is describing here. 
to love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind is to love Him with your complete and whole being, right? I mean, everything about you would be about Him. And say it again, everything about you would be about Him in your love. That's the completeness of you. When you bring all three together in a love for the Lord, that's a completeness. And that would bring about a great moving of God in your life. The mind has the ability to think good or evil. I think everybody understands that. You know, there's those times you're driving down the road, and boy, you're singing, you're happy and everything like that, and all of a sudden somebody cuts you off in the road like that, and it changes from good to evil. Somebody, your, your, your day is great. You go to work, and boy, somebody is down your throat on something that is that means nothing, or they, they just got it out for you, and, and boy, I tell you what, it changes all of a sudden if you're not careful. The mind has the ability to think good, but it also has that ability to think evil. There's the mind that is contrary to the will and the ways of God, and therefore not a mind that is pursuing to love the Lord. If it's contrary, it's, it's not going that direction. Now, there's times in your life, in my life, that our mind is, not contra- is, is, is going contrary. It's going away from God. It's going a different direction than what God wants us to. So I don't quite understand that. Well, it's like this. Do you submit to absolutely everything God's had you do? Hmm, probably not. None of us have. Not immediately. Well, that means that your mind was contrary to it. It means it was going a different direction. If God said, and His Word says, I want you to, I want you to do this and this and this and this, and you say, eh, I don't think, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. you're going contrary to it. And so to have a mind that is contrary to God is to have an, a mind that's at enmity with God or at war with God or an enemy of God. So, preacher, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I love the Lord. I'm not an enemy of God. But your mind can be basically a carnal mind that is an enemy of God. In fact, in Romans 8, 6 and 7, it says, For to be carnally minded is death. And we're talking about a spiritual death here. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, otherwise an enemy, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Otherwise, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to, I don't want to obey the Bible. I don't, want to, I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what the Bible says. I want to live my life this way. Okay, you're an enemy of God. Well, no, preacher, I'm saved. No, you're an enemy. I understand you may be saved, but your mind is a carnal mind, and it's at enmity with God. There's a battle between your mind and God's will. Okay? And so there's that type of mindset that many Christians hold. But when you have a mind that is seeking to grow and to serve the Lord, to love Him, and to follow Him, that doesn't mean it's a perfect mind. But what it does mean in 1 John 3, 22, says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments... And do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And so we serve Him and live for Him, to magnify Him, to glorify Him. That comes from a place in your mind. You see, you don't respond without your mind being involved. There's some type of reaction, there's some type of interaction with the mind, even in serving the Lord. Therefore, our thinking that overlaps the heart and soul affects our affections, and what we do. Okay? Your mind is going to affect how much you brag on the Lord. Your mind's going to affect how much you serve God. Your mind is going to affect how much you worship the Lord. Your mind is going to affect what you say about the Lord. Your mind is going to affect your testimony and what you, how you live before this word for the Lord. Your mind, you see what I'm saying? It overlaps your affections. It overlaps what you do with your life. It's not that, okay, my mind's not where it ought to be necessarily in loving the Lord like I ought to, but I'm going to, I love him, boy, and, and that's, boy, my heart's in love with him. My friend, can I tell you what? Uh, it overlaps, it all comes together. 
And so it aff- they affect one another. And the mind has a way of overlapping those in a greater way and affecting that. Because your mind has ways of bringing things in that will squelch your love, that will keep you from serving God. And so that mind is important, what we do with the mind and how that we love with the mind. It's so important in our, in our Christian walk and how we live. It affects our affections and the way we live, uh, our thoughts and those affections. But each of us have a choice in our thinking and, and what we will allow our minds to dwell on. You have a choice. Oh, preacher, I, you know, this world is just hitting me and, and I don't have any uh, choices. You have a choice. You have a choice. I'm so tired of people saying, well, I, I, you know, I was, I was just raised, you know, and, and, and everything in my, my childhood and everything. And it just messed me up. And I just, I just I, it's not my fault. It's my childhood. Can I tell you something? You have a choice. Amen. I'm not going to say there's not scars. I'm not going to say there's not obstacles to overcome. But you have a choice. And it's the same way as a Christian. There may be difficulties around you. You may have been raised in a, in a home. Can I, can, can I say something here? With all due respect, I was not raised in a Christian home. My mom and dad didn't get saved until what our third child was born. My mom and dad didn't go to church with me. My grandparents kind of got us going to church some. And then, to be honest with you, I started going to church because of a girlfriend. Don't tell me that everything wasn't just in line for you, and so therefore you didn't have any choices. No, you've got choices. I've been involved in the bus ministry in the churches for years since I was still in high school. And then as a youth pastor, and see kids come out of drunken homes, drug addiction homes, abusive homes. They're involved and got saved, they're involved in serving and loving the Lord this very day. Sister or brother, not in there. But they made a choice. We have a choice in how we're going to think. Doesn't mean it's always easy. Doesn't mean we always make the right choice. But we have a choice. And we should begin to think on the right things and do what the Lord wants us to do. We had that choice. I, I, I used this verse last week and, and as we talked about it. And as a filter, Philippians 4, 8 uh, says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Do you know what you have to do? I don't care how you was raised and how long you've been saved. Even if you was raised in, a, in a, a good Christian home and everything, you still have to make a choice to apply that verse to your mind. My kids raised in a, in a, in a, in a preacher's home. Still themselves, not the preacher, but themselves have to make a choice what they're going to think on. And to filter it through the Word of God. The truly born-again Christian is moved by the Spirit of God, though, to dwell or to think upon that which is pleasing. But it comes down to us choosing to walk in that Spirit. You see, we do have some help in that area. Not only is the Scripture there for us to see and read on what we're to do, but the Holy Spirit deals with our heart about, hey, that's not the right thing to think on over here. This is the right type of thing to think on. And there's a conviction in the, in the heart and life of a Christian that, hey, listen, you don't, need to be, you don't need to be looking at that. You don't need to be thinking on those things. This is what you ought to be looking at and thinking on. And so we have 
that choice to make. And so we've got to make some choices in life. And, and, uh, and one of them is, is, is what are we going to think on? But we have the help by the Spirit of God. As a Christian, you, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God moved in. What? No, you're not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have a God. You're not your own. For you've been bought with Christ, therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. But we find over in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. And notice what he says here. Walk in the Spirit. We'll say it again. Walk in the Spirit. Otherwise, that's being submissive to the Spirit of God. It's like this. Come here. To walk in the Spirit, this is the Spirit of God, is for me not to be here and dragging the Spirit with me. That's not walking in the Spirit. Here's what walking in the Spirit is. He leads and I follow. That's walking in the Spirit. But too many times we want this. We want the Spirit to go where we go and want Him to put His stamp of approval on what we say and what we do. Thank you. So, if we would walk in the Spirit, we'll not walk and fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me read that, get it right here. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I'll follow the Spirit of God in my heart and life, in my mind, I'll not fulfill those lusts that comes, and they are going to come. Don't sit here and think that they're not going to come. They are going to come. Why are they coming, preacher? Because you are still in a body that did not get saved. This flesh doesn't get saved. The spiritual man comes alive. The spiritual man's saved. The spiritual man's going. This body's going back to the dust. It has a sin curse on it. It still wants to do what the world's doing. But you've got to say, okay, I'm not going to let the flesh... Uh, uh, guide me. I'm going to let the Spirit of God guide me in how I think. My thinking. What I'm going to think on. And so we have a choice. You can do that or you can just let your mind wander. How many times have you ever sit there and just it's like you, you know, you ever been in a, in a boat and you're just sitting there, boy, you, you, you're running down there and all of a sudden you just kick the thing up in neutral? And she just float and going wherever it wants to go. When it's in neutral, you can turn that steering wheel on that thing, on that boat. It really don't make any difference. Very little. You got to have that thing in gear. Our problem is, is our minds need to be in gear, following the Spirit of God, not kicked up in neutral to let anything direct us and anything to pull us and anything to take us off the direction that we're to go for the Lord. When we sit by idly, it's a, it's a dangerous thing. <laughs> in, in premarital counseling, and you've heard me talk about this before, I talk about how women are wired and how men are wired. Women are wired like spaghetti. That's how they think. That's the way God made them. I'm not being crude and rude, but that's it. God made a woman. That's why she can ask you a question. She can tell you what you're having for supper. She can ask, she can tell you something else. She's thinking about what tomorrow's going to do. And then all the way over here, there's something that nobody has any idea what she's thinking. <laughs> and this is all happening at once. Now, God made them that way. They're like spaghetti, intertwined. Guys, get used to it. <laughs> That's why when she asks you a question, you go, uh, and she says, something else. And before long, she said about four things, and you still haven't answered the first one. <laughs> but guys are like a waffle. Waffles got those little squares in them. We think on one thing at a time. Fishing. Job. Church. Um. Uh, Hunting, repairs on the house, finances. And we got these boxes. We only go to one box at a time. In the middle of that is a box, and it's empty. That's why, ladies, when you ask your husband what you think about it, he goes, 
Nothing. <laughs> nothing. How many ladies have I ever asked your husband, what do you think about it? He said, nothing. Come on now. How many of you? How many? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? He's not lying to you. <laughs> He's not thinking about anything. He's in that box. I love that box. But we make choices of what we think. And so we've got to be cautious that those, the Spirit of God leads us in that direction that we're to go. So, with that said, we've got to intentionally think upon the things of God in order to train our way of thinking. You don't just get a little puppy or a dog and, and somebody bring it to it and maybe you bought the, the puppy and everything, whatever, and they bring it in the house and you go and say, okay, Fido, here's the way it is. You see that bowl over there? That's the only thing you eat out of, right there. The food is in the cupboard. You want some, you get it. You pour it out. Don't spill it on the floor. There's the back door. When you got it, you go to the back door. You go outside. I'll put a chair there. You can hop up on it, turn the doorknob, go on outside. Be sure and close it so that the neighbor's cat don't get in. You can do all you want to. That dog's not going to do anything. You've got to train that dog to do what you want to do. Now, I doubt you're going to train to do what I just told you to do. But I want you to understand that that dog has to be trained. Can I tell you that you have to train your mind, I have to train my mind. It has to be trained. The world is trying to train it. The world is constantly playing ads to train you to think about their product, to train you to do business with them, to train you to vote a certain way, to train you to spend your money a certain way, to train you to wear certain clothes, to train you to fix your hair a certain way. Well, some of us ain't got much choice. The world is constantly trying to train you. You can call it what you want. You can call it advertising. But what they're trying to do is train you to be obedient to them. Can I tell you something? You've got to train your mind to be obedient, to think upon the things of God. To love the Lord, to serve Him, to, and, and to the Word of God. You have to train. So you've got to do that intentionally. It don't just happen. That's like when you come in here. Can I, can, I, can I just be honest with you? When you come in here and you sit down to hear the preaching, whether it's me or somebody else or a Sunday school teacher, you have to intentionally want to hear, want to learn, want to receive, and want to apply what's taught. Otherwise, you know what it is? Over the top of your head, you're thinking about fishing. You're thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking about what's something to eat when you get home. Am I right? So you have to tell yourself, and most many times on a Wednesday night, and I completely understand that, is this, that you come in, you've been working all day. You've been out in the heat or maybe you've been out in the cold. You come in, the temperature's just, you know, comfortable in here. Uh, if it's been hot all day, it's, it's cool in here. You sit down, you're tired, and, 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 you, and, you, and you struggle. So you have to tell yourself, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Same thing in the wintertime. And so we have to train our minds to zero in. Sometimes you have to train your mind to listen to the preaching. Because we come in, I'm supposed to go to church, I'm supposed to, we're not supposed to sing some songs, we're supposed to pray, and, and, and we have to train our minds, we have to say, I, I need to zero in on what the preacher's saying and what the Word of God has to say. We have to train our minds. And I'm not just talking about me preaching, I'm talking about training our minds for the Word of God. So you have to apply yourself in thinking, first of all, your mind to know God and His holy will. You've got to train yourself to do that. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You know what we do? We think of that, okay, I need to go do this first for the Lord. No, it says, but seek ye first. You know that you cannot seek something without it going through your mind first. You cannot seek the Lord first without thinking about it. 
You must think upon that. There must be a desire in your heart to not only hear it and read it and hear the preacher preach about it, but to do it. You have to think about it. Otherwise, you're sitting there and, and the Holy Spirit saying, hey, listen, you need, to, you need to seek the Lord first in your life. There's so much going on in your life. Put the Lord first. Put the Lord first. Put the Lord first. Put the Lord first. You got a choice to make. Yes, that's what I need. Before you'll ever do it. You begin to think on it. You begin to think things, well, what does that mean in my life? Or, and so forth. And what's the Lord trying to show me here? And, and you begin to think upon it. But he says, seek you first. The seeking always begins in the mind. The seeking is in the word of the Lord. It's in prayer. It's in fellowship. In, it's in his creation. It's in godly songs that lift him up. There's a seeking in all of those things that comes together as you seek the Lord to put Him first. These things impact your mind, which impacts the heart, the affections, and impacts your living soul. That's living for the Lord. By receiving with the mind, with gratitude and pleasure, the truths of, of God, who, 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 he, who He is, what He's done, how He loves you, what He has prepared for you, and so on. Otherwise, what I'm saying is, is as you seek Him, as you, as you think upon Him, there's some things that you need to be thinking about. Brother, Brother Dustin, what has He done for you? But you can stop and think about some of those things, can't you? Salvation, forgiveness of sin, mercy, peace, joy, blessings, Direction, fellowship, presence, power of God. But many times we don't think about when I'm seeking the Lord, I need to think about what He's done in my life. Where I was headed. Where I'm going now. What He did to change my life. Where I would be if He hadn't saved me. How He brought about my salvation. How He worked in my life to bring me to where I am and where I should be. What He wants to do in my life. His love. When I didn't deserve it and, and you begin to think upon those things. That is the seeking, seeking Him. It begins to affect your Affections. Man, he loved me that much. And next thing you know, there's some love starts boiling up in your own heart for him. He done that for me. And for long, the soul says, I need to live for him. But until you get to the place, if all you're thinking about is that next dollar, the only thing you're thinking about is that next vacation, the only thing you're thinking about is that next home, that next car, the, the, the next ball game, the next whatever it might be, and you don't take that time to seek Him, your affections go flat. And your living for the Lord goes flat. And so we must think on those things. I'm talking about training your life to think on the goodness of God. To think about what He's done for you. What He's doing for you. What He has for you. About Him coming again. Training your mind to daily and to think on things like this. We get so caught up in I don't have this and I don't have that. And our mind is always going in that direction. And so we need to seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness. Secondly, you then meditate upon these things. You think about them. You meditate upon them. And then you exalt the Lord in your thinking. Otherwise, you think about those things. Let's just use salvation, how the Lord saved me. You know, I, I go through the, I can go through how that I was under conviction, how the Lord just kept bringing things to pass and how He kept dealing my heart and how I got saved. 
The next thing is, is that I want to exalt Him. I should, I, as I think on these things, I exalt the Lord in my thinking. Otherwise, I raise Him up. Look what He did. He saved me. I was a sinner on my way to a devil's house. Thank you, Lord. And I begin to exalt Him and begin to magnify Him in my thinking. No one else could do that. No one could save my soul. Look how much he loved me. Look how much he cared for me. And I, I begin to exalt him in my thinking. Raising the Lord. Raising up the word of God. How it's alive and it speaks to our hearts. And how he guides us. His ways above. His, his, the Lord himself. His word and his ways are above your thoughts and ideas and ways. And say, Lord, I am nothing but you're everything. My thoughts aren't anything, Lord, but you're something. My ways are nothing but your ways are everything. David, which the Lord said was a man after his own heart, put it this way in the Psalms. Psalms 34, 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord. Have you ever took a magnifying glass? Everybody in here has had magnifying glass. Some of you guys know what you did. You used to burn ants and stuff like that with them. But take that thing and boy, you, 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 you're trying to look at your fingerprint or maybe a splinter. You get that magnifying glass and boy, you can pull that thing up. I got one of those things on my phone. Where I can, I hit the thing three times like that and, it, and, it, and I can, boy, I can start raising it up there. Gets down and gets scary looking. That's magnifying it. I mean, it's enlarging it. And the reason that it's enlarged is so that you can see every aspect of it. As you magnify the Lord in your thinking, as you exalt Him in your thinking, you begin to look at every aspect of the Lord. How good He is, not just in saving your soul, but in every part of your life. That's the type of thinking that we need about the Lord, about the things of God, if we're going to love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. The psalmist, David also there in Psalm 69, 30 says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. So what he's doing, in his, as he's thinking on him, as he's, as, it, as he's saying, wow, look at what God, he begins to, he, he, he pins a song, a, 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 a Dustin Wright song, he pins a song about the Lord magnifying, letting everybody know how good and how great he is. He sings it out. And then only, not only that, but he gets up and he says, I want to thank God for what he's done for me. Amen. With thanksgiving. I mean, that mind just kicks in. And boy, I tell you what, as he's thinking on the Lord, it's just like, man, I just can't hardly wait. I just can't, I just gotta say something. I just gotta sing something. I just gotta lift him up. David speaks of the magnifying the Lord openly, not just in his mind, not just to himself, but magnifying the Lord with his mind and your thinking. And thirdly, we must have our mind or thoughts fixed. Upon the Lord. The word that is used in the verses that I'm about to read to you, fixed, means to be set on or determined. Set on, taken a hold of. The psalmist said in Psalms 57, verse 7 says, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. What David is saying, he said, it would be like this. My eyes are fixed on you. You know, we all do this little thing. <laughs> That's what David's saying. Lord, I'm fixed on you. Doesn't matter what happens out here. Doesn't matter what's going on. I'm fixed on you. Boy, it's time for Christians to get their hearts, their minds, and their soul fixed on God. Looking unto Him. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, <clears throat> the, author, uh, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Him. Fixed on Him. Psalms 108.1 says, Oh God, my heart is fixed. Not just my eyes, but my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise with my, uh, with my glory. 
Psalms 112, verse 7, he says, he shall, not be, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Fixed on the Lord. Remember, the heart and the soul and the mind, they overlap. They go together. He's the one we trust. He's the, the one that we love. He's the one that we'll, that we'll praise and we'll give honor and glory to. We're fixed upon Him. We're not interested in all this other stuff. We've determined that the Lord and no one or, or anything else in, in, is our God. Only Him. The Lord Jesus Christ. And, and He's the Lord of our lives, deserving our love and praise above all else. That's being fixed upon Him. In your mind, your mind has to be fixed on... He, he, and put it this way. Have you ever had something on your mind so much you thought about it even when you went to bed, you couldn't hardly even sleep? I mean, it's just, it's there. That don't happen to me too often. I go to bed, and Janine, I hear, uh, are you asleep already? It's getting real faint. I don't answer her because if I do, she wants to talk. <laughs> Five minutes, I'm gone. Ten at the most, usually. But there's times that I'll wake up in the middle of the night, or maybe I go in and there's something on my mind, and I can't get past it. I keep, it, it just keeps rolling over in your mind, doesn't it? Or it might not even be of a night when you go to bed. It may be all through the day. There's just, man, there's just something. You're rolling. It could be something good, some, you know, something that's really bothering you. You know, there's a lot of things. But I'm just... I'm just trying to use that as an example. Something that, that you cannot, as we say, get it off your mind. Your mind is fixed on it. Our mind should be fixed upon the Lord. Fixed upon Him. Not the things of this world, but fixed upon Him. Fourthly, we intentionally have to think upon His goodness unto us. In Psalms, 83, or in Psalms 8 and verse 3 says, When I consider the heavens, or thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. He said, when I consider. To consider something is to think upon it. My friend, we need to consider the things of God. It will do you good to walk out in the middle of the night on a clear night and look up into those stars and begin to just look at the magnificent handiwork of God. It do you good to take a walk in the woods this fall. Look at the 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 trees and the and all that God has made, and just consider His handiwork. It do you good to reach down and pick up that little baby, look into that little face and those eyes, and consider the handiwork of God. It do you good to look at maybe that ailing mother or ailing father and then all those wrinkles and all that gray hair and all the blemishes and the weakness of voice to see the mighty work of God. See, preacher, how could that be the mighty work of God? Because it's getting close to the finished product. As, it steps, as they step over into eternity like Miss Brown just did. The body will lay down. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And one day that new body comes. The miraculous hand of God. All that He's done, considering Hebrews 12.3 says, For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied 
and faint in your minds. Look at that verse. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Look at that verse. For consider him. Let's break it down. For consider him. Who are we considering? Jesus Christ. We're thinking, we're considering, we're looking, we're gazing upon, we're looking at every aspect of it. When you consider something, you're looking at every part of it. Just like a, an engaged couple will go to a jeweler and begin to look at rings. They're looking at every facet of it. They're looking at the cost of it. They're looking at different things, the, the shape of it, the, the makeup of it, the, the brilliance of it, the quality of it. When you look at the Lord, look at the, the makeup of Him, the brilliance of Him, every facet of Him. And consider Him, He says, for consider Him. Who is it that endured such contradictions of sinners against Himself? Consider what Jesus Christ went through for you and me. Consider the suffering on the cross. Consider the crown of thorns. Consider the beard plucked from His face. Consider the spittle that was spit into His face running down His face. Consider the stripes upon his back that cut into his flesh and pieces and chunks of flesh hanging. Consider the blood streaming down. Consider the nails driven in those hands. Consider this is the Son of God dying for you and for me. Consider what He did for us. Think upon it. And how He rose again. He said, lest ye be wearied and faint. Where? In your minds. When this world begins to come crowding in on you as a Christian... And when it seems like everything is against Christianity and when everything seems to be going contrary to living for the Lord, and when it seems like everybody says, oh, that's old-fashioned, when it seems like everybody's saying, yeah, you're, just, you're just out of date, when everybody's saying, oh, forget going to church, consider, lest you be wearied in your mind. And it will renew your strength to live for the Lord. Consider. Think upon it. Sadly, we fail to consider to take time to just meditate. As that song from the, from, uh, the Word of God that, that Brian led us in, to meditate upon the Word of God. Take time to think upon the goodness of God. Meditate upon it. You see, our love, in, our love in our mind will be moved for Him as we consider, as we think upon His goodness and His mercy unto us and to others. And lastly, when you've done all that, then through love, with all of your mind, submit to His ways and submit to His Word, and submit to His Spirit. He tells us in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, He said, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. When you love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind, his commands are way and, or, and ways are not grievous. That word grievous means burdensome or heavy. 
when we think upon Him, when we love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, that mind touches the affections, that stirs the heart to, and the soul to live for Him. No longer is it our duty, but it's our opportunity to live for Him. It's so important that we love the Lord with all of our mind. As I said in the beginning, never forget that it overlaps. It affects your affections. And it affects your soul or your living for the Lord. Let's bow. Father, we thank you. We love you. Thank you that we can consider from the Word of God the things of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that there's an understanding tonight. Oh, I wish I was a better preacher. Or I wish I could illustrate better. But Lord, I know the Holy Spirit can do what I cannot do. So therefore, Lord, will we train our minds to think, to consider, to remember, to exalt, to magnify, that we might fall more in love with you, that it might affect every facet of our lives, our heart, and our soul. Maybe tonight, Lord, we just need to find a place and say, Lord, I love you. And just brag on you. Just lift you up. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name.